Hello and welcome to season three of Back to Britpop. It's me, Chris. So I've decided to start season three early as I had guests already recorded and guests planned uh, for the next couple of months. So it just seemed silly to me to keep all those great interviews in the can. Uh, and so I decided just to get cracking. And so we're kicking things off uh, on episode one of season three with Billy Reeves. And Billy Reeves is one of the founding members or the founding member of the band, The Audience, who you remember had uh, a couple of hit singles in the late 90s with Sophie Alex Bexter as uh, the front lady or lead singer. And then after that band, he started a new band called Yours. And then Billy had a horrendous life-changing uh, accident, which leads us on to his current project, The Helicopter of the Holy Ghost, which features Mark Morris of the Blue Tones on vocals and Creole Electon as well features in the band. He's been in multiple bands and the Departure Lounge being one of them. It's an amazing story and a really interesting insight into sort of where Billy fits in in the whole kind of 90s music scene. And he was a, a great sport uh, in terms of some stories and anecdotes that he had to share. As per usual, I'll be back at the end of the podcast to talk about all the ways that you can support it, but I'll stop waffling and hand over to Billy. Welcome to the podcast, Billy Reeves. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well indeed. Thanks for having me on. I'm not as famous as the normal um, Billy Bunters you have on, but I would, <laughs> I would claim Sophie Ellis Bexter is the most famous person uh, from the period as she's been on the front of Woman Down and Strictly Come Dancing. And I understand something else. The Masked Singer, yes. I didn't know she was on The Masked Singer. I thought that's, <laughs> well, I, I was today days old when I found that out. But good for her. Well, I mean, I think everyone was screaming at the television. We all knew who it was, apart from the the, the panellists, who's obviously told to not reveal any sort of idea who they might think it will be until at least four or five episodes in to the Saturday sort of schedules. Yeah, because um, she's got quite a dis- she's got a very distinctive voice. I don't know how... Exactly. You, you would exactly. know that it would, well, that is amazing. I'm gonna to have to go. Presumably it's on it's on ITV Hub. It's on ITV, isn't it? The Mars Singer. That's why I've never seen it, because I I was taught as a child never to watch commercial television. <laughs> yeah, you, you you'll be able to relive live it at your your heart's content. But yeah. <laughs> apart from oh. obviously apart oh. from missing out on on the Mars Singer, which you're gonna to have to catch up on. <laughs> I mean, how, how's your dare I ask, how's your last 12 months been in terms of the the whole situation that we've been in well i've been very fortunate um in that i can work from home i've been really really fortunate and just like you know like you and like everybody watching the kind of horror unfold you know I've, i know people that have been affected i'm double dabbed which i'm grateful for um my mum had a heart attack and caught covid in hospital she's fine now so like a lot of people i've been through i've yeah, been through it. and of course it, as it goes on how about you yeah, exactly the same. Um, lots of firsts for lots of lots of things. You know, obviously homeschooling for a long period of time during lockdown oh, right. was a was a was a quite a large eye opener. A lot of fun and a lot of pressure, I think, as well. But I think pressure that I didn't need to sort of bestow upon myself. I could have, in hindsight, taken things a little bit more easier with them, bless them. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, lo- affected lots of ways by lots of different people. I mean, one thing you could say is in terms of you know putting material together is that you, you mentioned the album uh, that you you're releasing soon from the band the helicopter of the holy ghost i mean this yeah, is the something heli- the, the helicopter of the holy ghost chris yeah the <laughs> album's called afters yeah the helicopter that's right yeah i'm putting an album out the, the helicopter of the holy ghost sorry you were saying is it, i mean this this album has come out where does it come from in terms of either just getting together with the band or forming this band and and obviously i've, I've looked a little bit at the history in terms of you know the songs or the lost songs so to speak but Tell me the story in terms of just getting this well, it's, ready well, it's to release. Not a, it, it's not a lockdown album. Uh, it was done before lockdown, um, but lockdown gave us a chance to decide what we were going to do with it. But yeah, so I was after um, realising that I'd made a complete fool of myself in the audience, I did it again. I signed another deal in 1999 with Sony um, with a band called Yours. And I think these songs are probably from that. Yours went a little bit wrong um, because the record company did. And uh, yeah, so I, I started at my club again, Uncle Bob's Wedding Reception, and we had the darkness on on the 1st of September 2001. So we'd all been around watching Michael Owen score in the 5 1 against Germany. I didn't know anything about the darkness. I knew that they, I knew Dan really well because he was the T boy at Rondor Studios, which was my publishing company. And they obviously. <laughs> 
they let me use the studio thinking I was a hit writer, either that or they wanted some of their advance back. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I, I bumped into them at a do the darkness and um, I'd seen their band Empire. Uh, who were a bit like Radiohead, Justin played keyboards. I, I said, well, are you doing anything with Empire? I said, no, no we're in a new band now. Uh, we're a bit like the gay ACDT. I said, you're booked. So they were, um, no, we didn't know anything about them at all. We didn't know what, they, what there was about a hundred of my mates just watching the darkness do their thing. You can imagine what that was like at the water ramp. Um, on the way home, I took my mate Jim home in my Morris Minor and we were hit at 99 miles an hour by joyriders being chased by the police on Hangar Hill. And that's pretty much the last thing I remember. I remember the night really well because it was almost my last night. So I was trashed a bit. We were both in a coma for ages. Missed 9-11. That happened to everybody except I didn't know anything about that really. And I didn't know about the other two planes until 10 years later. Christ. It happened to everybody in the world except me and my family. And then I don't remember, I don't, really don't know, there's loads of massive gaps because I had such head injuries. I've been told about what happened in hospital. Then 2017, my brother was having his house reconfigured and he had a box in the loft with all the police reports and everything. And amongst that was two mini discs um, because apparently in the Morris, the hi-fi in the Morris was a mini disc player. One had um, Can You Handle 74 Minutes of the Shadows on it. <laughs> uh, which, uh, which was uh, which uh, which I played when I, I played these to see mini discs and it wasn't 20, 74 minutes of the shadows because some of it was the John Barry seven and the other one was a bunch of demos and backing tracks which must have been around the yours time because apparently yours did gigs and I played drum I don't remember anything about that and it's me sort of like going, ah, nah. and I thought well these are really good and Richard Archer from Hard Fight is a mate of mine lives near me and he said oh you know I've got technology that could fiddle around with this could take some of the vocals off. Crayola Lepton, um, who is one of the greatest musicians the country has ever produced from the great Worthing psychedelic scene, um, he um, basically MD'd it, uh, musically directed it, um, worked stuff out, played it on a piano. But as I don't need to tell you, once me and Richard had fiddled with it a little bit and we got some work out, we had a cosy 18 minutes. So, um, Trail the Lectern uh, wrote a couple of songs for it, but of course it was getting Mark Morris to sing it. And I didn't, I didn't realise this, or I'd forgotten it, that Mark, Scott and Adam from the Blue Tones used to come and see my band when I was a student. They're quite a bit younger than me. They used to come, um, we were from Kingston and we played the Dodgy Club and the Sausage Machine at uh, West Hampstead, which is the two pure records, Stereo Lab, PJ Harvey and that. And they used to come and see us play because they were so keen on coming to see music. I actually know, I've got mutual friends with Mark that go back further than I thought. And he's been really kind in interviews talking about the Grooveyard, the band I was in at the time. Having Mark sing it has lifted it to a professional standard. Uh, and then I, um, when lockdown happened, I gave, I gave it to K-Scope. And K-Scope said, yeah, let's release it. So we were really fortunate again in that K-Scope uh, released so many vinyl records because they're a kind of prog rock label so, uh, by Stephen Wilson. So they uh, booked a load of time uh, with the pressing plants in Germany. So we were lucky to get it. Uh, it had come out, I do wonder if it had come out on any other label, whether it had got the, um, in the end of vinyl. So in terms of describing this, the sound that you've created, and you sent me the singles, which, are, which I loved, and it's, the pace of it is is different, isn't it? Would you say in terms of like what you've done in the past? And can you remember, yeah. or do you do you know where you were in terms of no, the writing? I've no, I've, I've no idea, and I think it's like I say, it's probably written for um, a woman. Um, the singer of yours was a woman. Um, it's probably gentle because that's the idea of that band. It was supposed to be gentle. Um, I didn't have to change any of the lyrics or anything to make them male or female. So I have no idea. I don't know what, I, but it's nice to have something gentle. I think that, um, you know, we're all men of a certain age in this group. So it would be ridiculous if we suddenly started playing metal. Although it'd be quite funny, um, which is which is why I thought of Mark, because, you know, Mark's voice has a feminine quality. So I've, I, I can't answer that question because I really don't know who they were written for, why they were written. But interestingly, I don't know what they're about. So it's interesting trying to work out what and who they're supposed to be about. They do sound, some of them do sound quite autobiographical. Yeah, in, in terms of like mixing and the process of just bringing the songs together, what kind of emotions were coming from, from you? I mean, when you were sort of 
you know constructing these these uh, these, it's, it these do, music it, do, it does sound like there could be some emotions but the accident was such a long time ago and i went through such hell with it um you know to learn how to walk again apparently um you know was housebound for a year i had to i went back to university and retrained as a broadcast journalist i had loads of support it's almost like it didn't happen to me it was as soon as i started taking control of it um once i was well enough to um you know swim and do exercise i had to have loads of other operations once i started taking control of it then it was down to me it wasn't down to anybody else yeah it was my family that went through all of that so as far as the kind of emotions of the um the post-accident are concerned it, it, apart from trying to be trying to work out what i'd missed and who i'd missed and who i should be grateful for it brought back a lot of those memories it really brought it back for my brother and my mother and my wife and stuff mm. but when it comes to the when it emotions of the songs it was actually quite a useful thing if i'm a songwriter which i'm not but if i was a songwriter it's interesting from that point of view to it i can take a complete step back from it with completely fresh ears and decide whether or not it's any good um, but I, that was re- that was really dominated by the fact that there was so little of it <laughs> anybody that knew me around 1999 knows what these songs are about uh, <laughs> let me know we'll do lunch <laughs> or indeed if anybody's on it i mean i think i've you know, when it comes to strings and little bass parts and stuff, I I think I I've worked out who's playing on it, um, but there may be someone that um you know when it sells millions that will be knocking on my door. <laughs> I mean, you must be in some way kind of relieved to see the reviews coming in because it's it's been so well received, isn't it? That's interesting because I'm not sure so, some of those people, most of the, most of the people that will be reviewing it and writing about it, and there is some other stuff coming up, and um, Prog Magazine, The Guardian. The Quietus. Uh, I've done a long interview with the Quietus. Um, a lot of those people know me, so they know me. They know me of old, and they're fascinated by the story. So it's a case of it would be interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see what people who don't know me, who particularly like Mark. You know, not everybody likes the Blue Tents. Don't aren't particularly interested in some bloke who used to knock around with Sophie Ellis Baxter. It'll be interesting to see if it goes beyond its current marketplace. Because, I mean, 95, 97.3% of people who buy it will be people who know Mark's work, Mark's band, Blue Tones, and Mark's solo stuff. And they've been really, really kind. A lot of the, a lot, it's been well received by people who are, who know me and from my time as a press person and are fans of Mark. And, and fact, Mark's fans have been amazing. To, to follow the band on Instagram, follow the band on Twitter like they have and to spread the word like they have i've been really really grateful for that i think it helped that the blue tones weren't working they're going to be very much back back soon and mark wasn't you know his usual troubadour so it was a bit quiet on that front that was quite handy for me um mm. but the blue tones fans have been really really kind well i think it, it definitely sort of showcases as you said the, the the qualities of his vocal fit the musical style and and just the uh, the ambience of those tracks brilliantly yeah, I think so. And he he said in interviews that um, obviously keys would have been a problem or octaves would have been a problem. But he, you know, he's the main songwriter in the blue tones, and he tends to he's discovered that he tends to write at the very top of his voice, his envelope, and this gave him a chance to come down an octave or so. And as he said, croon. And I think he, he's learned a little bit that his voice perhaps has got a little bit more range than he thought. I didn't. I didn't really hear any different, particularly different qualities in his voice. But he was he was very proud of the fact that he was able to take these songs and sing them. Uh, you know, they were in my key. We didn't change any of the keys of any of them, and I don't know much about keys anyway. Yeah. He was also he also said something interesting recently in an interview that we did together for Rock Magazine. Um, Mark said that he was uh, good for him to do something where he wasn't in charge. And I thought, okay, well, that tells us quite a lot about the Blue Tones then. <laughs> yeah. He's the governor. That doesn't surprise me, though. Well, knowing Adam as I do, because Adam and I support the same football team. I see quite a lot of that. I've seen quite a lot of Adam over the years um, as we followed Brentford from the fourth division up to the Premier League. So, yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine that, yeah, that Big Mo is the gaffer of the Blue Tones. Do, do you think it's got legs i mean are you would you collaborate on on writing and recording more material for another for another release i can't really play music i I find it difficult to communicate with musicians because i don't really know much about and i don't really want to know much about um theory or anything i mean the audience started off as a was a bet 
and I'd never written songs before and I had to, you know, I learned the sort of basic, um, my ideas into actual music. It'd be great to be a lyricist. I quite, fancy, I quite fancy myself as a lyricist, but I don't, you know, you're in bands, you know how difficult it is. It, I, I hated all of that. I hated touring. I only did it for four months. I hate all, I hate all, I hate the kind of like chaos of the, of the music industry. There's a lot of music about, you know, mu music doesn't need me. But if there's anybody that needs a lyric, I can knock that out pretty quickly. Is that, I think you, do you think that's something you would explore, you know, going forward then in terms of just maybe sitting down and, and crafting songs and writing songs for other people? Well, if someone, if someone asks me to write lyrics for them, I'll write lyrics for them. That yeah. would be, that would probably be about as far as I could go. Um, because I was a musician then, and obviously I was quite manic doing, I was doing lots of stuff um, around that time, trying to get um, Columbia, trying to get Sony to release material by yours, because we only actually had one good song. We signed on the strength of one good song and the fact that our A&R person, Fran de Takats, had, was given free reign to sign a band for as much money as she wanted because she took A1, a boy band, excuse me, into recording a cover of Take On Me by Aha, which has been a big hit in Singapore. <laughs> I wish I was making that up. I think it's worth saying that again. A1 had been talked into doing a cover of Take On Me by their A&R person, and it had been a number one in Singapore. I mean, that's, that's, why, that's why we signed to Sony. That's how they had the money to sign us. It was extraordinary in those days. That's an amazing connection. I mean, that song, their <laughs> cover is, is bloody awful. But that... that, yeah. that because I remember it well, obviously. <laughs> what a stroke of genius. Let's, what song can we get at this boy band to cover? It was a hit and just extraordinary. Yeah. What was your main influences is when you, influences when you were growing up? But were you did you accidentally fall into music or, or was it something that happened in, in the home? I wasn't no, I'm not I'm not me I'm not musical at all. I don't come from a musical family or an artistic family. I'm 56, so it was disco and punk. Um, it was whatever was on top of the pops to start with, Motown and punk. And I think that um, punk has been written about to the point of ridiculous. I'm just slightly too young for the first wave of it. But the second wave of it is really interesting because the bands that were on top of the pops, specifically the undertones and the buzzcocks, where suddenly you were looking at people that looked like you, you know, wearing sort of like scruffy trainers and, and, and Parker anoraks. Um, the reason that those bands were on top of Pops a lot is that A, they were on major labels or the small ones, but there was union rules. And two of the union rules that helped those punk bands is there had to be a band on top of the Pops that were currently touring, and there had to be a band on top of the Pops that did their vocals live. And of course, it was very easy to get the punk bands in to do that because they were either touring or, or were performing live. So in a way, punk rock saved music. So that's my that's my era is buzzcocks and the understand disco is my big thing, or as I prefer to call it, proletarian sexy club funk. Um, <laughs> that's, that's my that's my bit. That's my bit. But it gets a very bad rep. Uh, so that's those those two are my big thing. So because by the time we're talking the audience, by the time we're, I'm working for Fire Records in the mid '90s, see, I'm too old for it all. So, I mean, I was 30 in 1995, so I was too old to be in a band, really. So my era is the era before that, really. Well, you said you, you formed the audience for a bet. I mean, you need to expand on that if you can, because how, how did that I come was, about? <laughs> I was working for Fire Records, so I was, in, I was at this <clears throat> tiny weenie little label that had just gone through a golden period, and then pretty much after I left, went through another golden period, and it's still going strong, Fire Records. Uh, it would have been 96. There was an, an argument ensued uh, between myself, Tony Judge, who was the art director of the Melody Maker, God rest his soul, and uh, Everett True, who was the assistant editor of the Melody Maker, God rest his soul, uh, and a guy called Paul Mather, who was their kind of like um, northern um, rip pop correspondent. He was the first person to do a live review of Oasis. An argument in Cuba, I said, it's just like the 80s, they're, they're chucking money about, I could get a record deal, even though I've never written a song. I tell you, I could tell you, it would take me a year, I could get a girl singer, I could all wear black pony, blah, blah, blah. so Tony Judge, well, a few drinks have been taken, so Tony Judge bet me 100 quid that I couldn't get a record deal within a year. That was the Tuesday. On the Wednesday, the aforementioned Paul Mather was at an Oasis photographic ex uh, exhibition at the Roundhouse, so that probably dates it. Um, Jill Fermanowski exhibition and Sophie and some of her friends from Kudilkin and Letterman 
had uh, climbed in through the window and they got to talk in Paul and Sophie got to, managed to work out who her mother was and uh, Paul said oh can you sing because I've got a mate that's uh, putting a band together and she said yeah of course I can sing and he said well come and meet me with a demo tomorrow at Billy's club and of course Paul being Paul didn't turn up I had completely forgotten about or had a vague memory of what had happened on the Tuesday so on the Thursday that's on the Wednesday on the Thursday Sophie turns up to the club that I was DJing at, upstairs at the garage and said is Paul Mather here I said no I said are you Billy here's a tape for you so she gave me this tape and she done it that afternoon her singing some Oasis songs with her cousin on guitar I put it in the tape player on the way back on the way back and thought well she looked amazing and she sounds really distinctive I wonder if I can put a band together so I learned the rudiments of guitar thought I can do stuff like stereo lab perhaps you know very droney and me and Dean Mullet who was the guitarist of one of the bands that were on fire me playing drums him playing everything else and Sophie singing we went into a recording studio the day that England played Scotland in Euro 96 <laughs> That was, that was the first demo, and I got a deal off the back of that demo. People started going, Sophie was doing her A-level, so I did all the kind of meetings. And it all kind of culminated seven months later at the Falcon. We'd done seven gigs, that was our seventh gig. And we'd got a band, I'd got a band together by that point. And uh, we did a gig at the, at the Camden Falcon, and the whole music industry was there. It was that old terrible cliche that the bomb had dropped on Camden that night. And they all offered me record deals, every single major label, every single um, publishing deal, because they were after Sophie, uh, thinking she was the new Debbie Harry, which, you know, in many ways she was. Um, so, yeah, so I won the bet, and he still owes me 100 quid. A story that you don't think you could ever reproduce in the current musical no, climate? No way. No <laughs> chance. I mean, it was hard enough then. I mean, it was getting ridiculous by that point, because, I mean, we signed in 97, the record came out in 98. I mean, it was getting silly by that point. There's, there's loads, you know, people that um, listen to your podcast will know all of those. And it's I'm really glad that some of them are being rediscovered. You can you can reel off hun a hundred band names, you know, mainly one word names. That's why the audience was one word. It was a bit of a kind of like nod to the tradition of Britpop, um, but, you know, the rules of Britpop. But there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of a massive explosion of it. And 10 years earlier, they'd have all been obscure indie bands playing Camden. But it was just, I was just in the right place at the right time, simple as that. What were the live gigs like, um, pro like proceeding to sort of getting signed? Would, would you gathering quite a, fo a following quite quickly? Not, yeah, not really, only really in London. And also that translated when we started touring, when the band started touring and started doing support shows and then did um did then did a tour of our own it didn't translate outside of london really mm. we were we were like menswear menswear were a huge influence on it you know the, what, what how they'd done how they coalesced around the, the blow up club i really admired them and i really liked those guys they were really funny and they were actually a much better group than you know people give them credit for the, the audience looked more famous than we actually were for two reasons one the melody maker had a sudden change of stewardship under Mark Sutherland and Mark Sutherland to try and save the paper took it much younger so they were doing stickers and stuff it was like supposed to be like kind of indie smash hits which mm. kind of killed it which kind of killed it in the end and there was that so they so the Melody Makers specifically some of the enemy but the Melody Makers specifically knew me and decided that we were one of their sort of pet projects and the other reason that once we signed we signed to Mercury and our A&R guy at Mercury great bloke called Alan Pell he had um, rejuvenated tech career because they'd had that one hit and they were just coming back as a kind of like Motown pastiche group with Clyde Boy and all the rest of it. The other reason that the audience looked more famous than we were is that people were phoning up the TV um, plugger at Mercury and saying, can we have uh, um, Texas on our show, please? And they would say, well, Texas aren't available, but we've got a new Texas uh, featuring uh, Janet Ellis's daughter. So we did a load of TV. We did a load of TV and of course we were terrible. We weren't a very good group. Sophie, you know, found it difficult to, you know, she'd never had any lessons or anything. So we were thrown in at the deep end a little bit. But no, we didn't, we had a following in London in that people from Blow Up and Uncle Bob's and stuff used to come along and sort of scream and shout. And there was a couple of fanzines. But once we started touring and getting it, we, you know, we were just, a, we were quite bog standard. Um, but people were just interested. It was four months, basically. We were really hip for four months. And we did the NME, we did the NME talk. Someone pulled out 
can't remember, it might have been, I think it was Ultrasound. Ultrasound Pull, who were mates of ours. Ultrasound pulled out. So we were added to the NME tour bill. So we, that was our first tour. Um, and the Stereophonics were on that tour, and they'd broken really big since they'd been invited on it. So we played in front of huge audiences in, on that. We were also, uh, as a result of that, when the fourth single came out, um, we were going to be the band doing Top of the Pop. You know, Top of the Pops around that time had kind of had the indie band on it, the uh, live. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Sort of went in the charts, the highest, and it was a toss up between us and the bloody Supernaturals. <laughs> and the Supernaturals won. They got to 19 and we got to 25. Um, so, it was all, so it was so dependent on stupid things like that. Uh, so, no, it, interesting you should say that. I think we just looked more famous than we actually were, but we didn't have a big following, no. There's an ill-fated performance of Glastonbury, 98. I mean, what... what... Don't, don't remind me. I hated touring. I was too old to do it. I got um, a little bit of uh, what would now be known as imposter syndrome, I think. And then Glastonbury was just awful. It was that year that it was completely liquid. I hate open-air festivals. I, I just thought my whole dream has come true and it's just awful. It's just really hard work. We went down in the van um, with a, a woman from 19 magazine. And when we got there, that you know, it's just piercing with rain and complete soup. We managed to kind of like struggle in. And as we got to the NME tent, uh, sitting forlornly in the rain on a amp was Michael Head from the Pale Saints stroke chat. Mm -hmm. You know, a man, a man to whom we should all fall at his feet, you know, a genius of God. And he was sitting there. So, so uh, hello, Mr. Head. Um, why are the vans stuck? We can't play. Uh, I said, we can use our gear. Uh, and the, you know, which was a normal response. And our um, tour manager uh, said, no, I'm not having, and by quote, a scout crackhead uh, using your gear, unquote. And I thought, this is it. That's the point. That's the point where I left the band. I thought, I, I don't, I hate this. This is just awful. Um, I don't want to do, I don't want to do this anymore. But we were um, told to go on immediately because Shaq's gear had been stuck somewhere up the hill. And I lost two of the band. They'd gone off to look for a toilet, Chris. A bloody <laughs> toilet. So they needed to go poo-poo. Right, so, I, so I lost two of the band. So I went on on my own. So the our gig at Glastonbury, about the um, first 10 minutes of it or so, it was just me. Just standing waiting for the band to turn up. We did our sort of like usual sort of like struggle through the gig with me thinking this really isn't very good. Playing in front of a sort of like hardcore 100 sodden individuals. And I like, you know, I trashed all my gear at the end, which is a terrible cliche thing to do. And then crowd surfed. But unlike Jack Black in School of Rock, I made it, it was only about, <laughs> the crowd was only about four rows deep. So they kind of put me down at the back. And then I had to kind of like work my way back around to like shame faced. I had to work my way back around all covered in shit. So yeah, it was, it was absolutely awful. And I'm still traumatized by it really. Fast forward a little bit, you had to re retrain yourself to do something completely different, and that's when you went got into broadcasting. I'd already done stuff in the old days of GLR in the nineties because I knew Gary Crowley really well from my time at Fire. I'd already done stuff at GLR. I was the kind of like tech guy going in to review um, records at, on the Drive Time program when when they had when it was more of a magazine. -y. And GLR, of course, it was quite powerful in those days because there was no Virgin, there was no XFM. You, you, they used to get the really big stars in. I produced Crowley's program when I started working for um, BBC London Live, as it was then, and he still had big people in McCartney, um, Nancy Sinatra, both of the um, Gallagher brothers. They could, DLR could really break a band in London. I'd already done stuff on that, and I'd already done stuff that uh, Sky had just started as well. Sky News had just started, and a couple of mates of mine from Polly. Um, got me in doing reviews on that as well. So when I had my <clears throat> accident and I thought, what am I going to do now? Once I was sort of enough to go back and do that, I started doing it again. And then I started working because um, I was quite disabled at that point. And that was quite a useful exercise for them to bring in uh, people from you know other, other communities, BBC, to work on setting stuff up. So I was doing the phone, setting stuff up. One of the producers of... Um, Drive Time said, why don't you go and do a degree in broadcast journalism? You could quite easily play into it. You've had enough experience now. So I did that. So I got offered two places. One was at City and one was at Westminster. 
her. And I got in on the course at Westminster, basically the guy um, running the course was from Manchester and he sat everybody around in a circle and he said, what can you tell me about Manchester? And I said, uh, when it was my turn, I said, John Cooper Park, and that's basically what got me in. They're just that, ah, just talking about John Cooper, John Cooper Park and Joy Division. I really enjoyed doing that and I had to work really hard at it because I was quite, um, I'm quite fit and there was lots of modern technology in studios. As a result of getting my degree, that meant that I could apply for jobs at the BBC. And my first job at the BBC, I, I boarded for Robert Elm's producer to cover someone who was taking a career break. So I produced Robert's programme, then Vanessa Felt's programme. When I got the compensation from the PRAC um, five years on, I decided that it was time to take a career break because it had been chaos and I, I was being very working hard and trying to get back to normal as soon as possible. When I came back from that, I did some trips. I came back from that, but um, the day I walked in the door, I was phoned by the person who does the tra travel presenting and said, I'm absolutely desperate. You come in tomorrow and do a traffic tour. And I got a job doing that. I boarded for that. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. And I also do, um, I did that full time for a bit. I do it um, part time now. Um, but I also do football commentaries as well, which I fell into by them as well. Um, for the BBC, and that's brilliant doing that. Although the you look round the um, press boxes sometimes and think, God, I'm the coolest here, and that's bad. <laughs> the last couple of years, it's improved hugely. There's much more. There's more younger people, more people of colour, more women, certainly more women, which has been really good the last couple of years. I've mentored a couple of them, uh, one of which now does um, stuff for Match of the Day, Vicky Parks and Emma Saunders, from who does on Five Live. Euros podcast by Blyer. So I fell into that by accident, but it's astonishing. I've been working for the BBC for 14, 15, 16 years now, and uh, at the same station. Astonishing, really, because BBC local radio really should have been kicked into the long grass by now, but it's more important now than it's ever been. So, in terms of this album, uh, the the helicopter album that you, you've got coming out, when when's the when's the due date for that? When's the release date officially? I mean, the helicopter of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's the which, one. Which, of course, which, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, is a, is a, a B-side uh, by Micro Disney, um, which I thought was being played over the tannoy at the hospital when I was taken from ICU into the uh, uh, MRSA ward, apparently. Ah, wow. Um, um, yeah, I was singing it to myself. And it was nice of them to play this. And they were going, you know, the nurses were going, what? There isn't a tannoy here. What you <laughs> uh, a lot of delusions. I was on a lot of drugs, man. Biomorphine, heroin, in other words. Yeah. I, it's come, it comes out on August the 13th. It's called Afters in the football sense of the word. And I'm not sure if you understand the, um, the football sense of the word afters. No, I just thought it was like pudding or, or something. No, it, was, well, it, can, it can mean pudding rather than marvelously, <laughs> but... I needed a short title because the name of the band, The Helicopter of the Holy Ghost, is so long. Yeah. So afters is from the football lexicon, and it means after a nasty tackle, there's a bit of a punch-up. Minor punch-up, a bit of afters. Ah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, but of course it can mean something sweet and, uh, and for your pudding as well. So it comes, <laughs> out, it comes out on August 13th on K-Scope Music, and it's available on Eco Vinyl. So I did wonder, as a little bit of an experiment, K-Scope were absolutely brilliant with me as to whether or not we could release a record that was climate neutral. So we worked with the climate neutral charity. So it's coming out on the thinnest vinyl you can get these days, which is unimportant. And everything is recycled. It's been done uh, completely climate neutral with a climate partner. It means that the CD is cheaper than a K-Scope CD normally would be. And I'm really, really proud of it because it's almost like I didn't write it. Crayola lectern, sending it from 18 minutes of me going, no, nah, yeah, yeah, by adding his material to it has really helped. And musicians that very kindly played on it for me and Richard Archer having produced it all really helped as well. That was especially, that was especially helpful when it came to bringing Mark into the band. If I'd have done it myself or at some local studio or something with Mark, but the fact that he come down to Richard Archer's studio was really handy. And I think it's absolutely brilliant, and a lot of you should definitely buy it. Well, the, as I say, the singles that, that you kindly sent me were, were very good and uh, had Thank a lovely you. relaxing hauntingness to them, which is I wish I'm well into. Yeah. Billy, I will let you go uh, into the hot summer's evening. Uh, um, and oh, uh, I, I hate outdoors. 
I, this time <laughs> of year, of course, you, you catch you catch me at the perfect time of year, of course, when I am struggling with insect bites. Um, <laughs> no matter how much I spray my, I'm not going outdoors anymore, Chris. So yeah, so I'm really struggling with the heat and the insect bites at the moment. I'm well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you then. Put it this way: get get on ITV Hub and get downloading the Mask Singer. That's oh, I can't, but, but presume, presumably uh, Sophie didn't win. No. So I only, I, how many episodes do I have to sit through? I don't think it's many. I think it's probably one or two. She may well have gone out first or second week. Maybe first What I want to know is how come you, how come you mentioned that you've got children? Is this, this how you know about The Masked Singer? Because it's a, well, I secretly love this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. I've got no, I've got no problem. Apart from the fact that it's on the ITA uh, and there's adverts involved, um, I'll check it out. God bless Sophie. She yeah. tweeted us today, which was really handy. So um, hopefully, uh, the, uh, and she came to my 50th birthday party quite recently. Um, so she's always been good to me and she did pay for my house. So maybe I'll, I'll, su- I'll further support her career by uh, watching the, ma- the alien on the masked singer. Thanks for that. Good luck with that, and I think you'll thank me later. I expect to tweet in in the, as a thank you. <laughs> thanks for having me on, Chris. It's really kind of you. Yeah, thanks ever so much, Billy. Take care. Massive thanks to Billy for joining me on the podcast. It was a great fun interview to do and loved hearing all the stories and anecdotes that Billy had to share. The music is great, so I've, I've put links to their Facebook page and uh, Billy's Twitter account or the band's Twitter, Twitter account in the show notes, so you can and explore that music so this is the part of the podcast where i ask for your support and those of you who've listened this far into each episode will be very familiar with this territory but as you know i make these podcasts and edit them and release them all off my own back without any financial support and within without any sponsors or anything like that and i love to do it obviously it's grown fantastically since the season one in the first lockdown where i had ideas to speak to some of the artists and, and musicians that i loved from my teens and early 20s and and the Britpop and 90s indie music era. It would mean so much if you could just follow me on the social media. So just search for Back to Britpop on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. The other way, which actually really helps as well, just to pay the server bill uh, at the end of every month to get this podcast out, um, is to donate if you'd like to. And you can do that by buying me a virtual coffee. And the link to that is in the coffee or Ko-Fi, however you want to pronounce it, link which is in the show notes. So just follow that link and you can do a one-off payment of £3 and that just helps in terms of uh, putting the podcast out every month. So that's it from me. Until next episode, I've got some cracking guests coming up. If everything goes to plan, season three is going to be about her and uh, it's growing all the time. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you for all your support. It means so much. So until next episode, take care.